he's the shove it man. <laughs> All right, the squad. The Hawk has made it home from Mexico safe and sound, and I'm back in Bridgewater Bay. Did you all miss me or what? But before I get into today's video, the Hawk has some crazy news. I'm pregnant. No, I'm kidding. No, but what I do have to tell you is having that rest has really made me rethink things. I was approaching modern wrestling with such a negative light on in the first place that I wasn't truly giving it a chance. And for that reason, I blame Slapnuts. You don't know what it's like. You people haven't experienced it. I might sound like I'm joking, but being shut in a room for 12 hours a day watching Jeff Jarrett matches on replay can really screw with your head. It turned me into a miserable human being. So, on that note, it's time for the Idiot Return series and I can watch some modern wrestling in a new positive light, with no chance of anyone ruining it. And yes, as I've improved, it's time for the Hulk to enjoy some modern wrestling because I should be able to enjoy that kind of thing now, right? Yes, this is the Idiot series where an old school wrestling fan, that's me, tries to go and watch some new wrestling and get some enjoyment out of it. Can I do it? Let's find out. Okay, let's start with Monday Night Raw and Kevin Owens, who has one of the best beards of all time. He's immediately joined by Sami Zayn, who's no longer with the bloodline. The commentators call it a beautiful sight. Over on SmackDown, these two became best friends again. I guess these two are super popular and they're like the rock and stone cold of this generation. They're here to talk about how great they each are. Owens is happy that Sammy is no longer with the bloodline because he's better than all of them. This promo establishes that they want to take down the bloodline at Wrestlemania. The Usos who are still in the bloodline and are the tag champions are here. They call Sami Zayn a backstabber. They all agree to fight for the tag belts at Wrestlemania. The United States champion is Austin Theory. He's set to face Wiener at Wrestlemania. But first, he faces a man called Montez Ford of the Street Profits. He seems like an excitable young man. I'm glad Fury isn't doing that selfie gimmick anymore. Ford shows some athleticism and says Fury can't see him. So this match is really just about building to the Cena match at WrestleMania. The fight spills into the crowd so Ford can sit on a man's lap. Unfortunately for Ford, nothing happens and he comes back to the ring and hits a crossbody. Ford now does a nice corkscrew uppercut into a back suplex into a standing moonsault. He keeps coming close to winning, but not quite. He hits an Inziguri kick and a big spike DDT. Fury tries to hide on the outside, but Montez hits a big flip plancher. They come back to the ring where Ford can't connect with his dive, and that allows Fury to hit the drop kick and his A-Town down finisher for the free. I am shocked how little offense Austin Fury managed. He's supposed to be going to WrestleMania to face Cena, but based on this show, Montez Ford looked like he should be the one that's going to WrestleMania. Bit weird booking. Fury does the standard point to the WrestleMania sign. But you know what? It's cool to see that again. We haven't seen that in a year. I'm excited for WrestleMania. The Bloodline sulk backstage about Sami Zayn leaving them. Roman sends everyone away, but Jey Uso. He looks like he's trying to push out a turd. Roman Reigns questions his loyalty. They stare lovingly at each other for a bit, and then it ends. Roman Reigns talks to wise man Paul Heyman like something out of the medieval times. It's great hearing people talk differently to what you would expect. Adam Pearce, master of one of the worst TNA matches of all time, has an interview interrupted by Chelsea Green. She wants to team up with Piper Niven from NXT, another TNA failure. She has a really unique look. Chelsea also wants to have a match at WrestleMania. She threatens management and says she'll block them on social media if she doesn't get what she wants. I wish they could have found a more compelling way for her to try and get a match. Bork Lesnar will be fighting WWE's only legit giant Omos at WrestleMania. They build this one up like it's a prize fight. Omos could be really good, but can he wrestle? I don't know. Can he do any 450s? I don't know. So he's going to need to impress the Hawks so I can get excited for that match at Mania. Then Omos actually has a match. He's accompanied by Montel Vontaneous Porter. He takes on Mustafa Ali. It doesn't go well for poor Ali, who seems to be doing a DDP gimmick. Omos wins with a choke bomb in just a few seconds. Still none the wiser if he can do any backflips. Backstage, Logan Paul blows off The Miz. This guy's a true star. The polarizing one is in the ring now. He's here to do a talk show. He winds the crowd up and says they have no choice but to watch him. There's of course time to hype up his prime drink. He calls the crowd dorks, which couldn't possibly be true. It's actually a good entertaining heel promo. He threatens Seth Rollins over a match at WrestleMania. They play an edited video of Jake Paul knocking out Seth Rollins time and time again. His mic starts cutting out. It was caused by Seth Rollins in the production truck. Then he immediately makes his way to the ring. They fight for like a second before some geeks break it up. 
But Seth is crazy and he dives on the security. Paul says, shut up or I'll smack you one. Dominic Mysterio will also have a match now. His dad's about to go into the Hall of Fame, but they're feuding with each other. Dominic wants a match with him at WrestleMania. Instead, he gets Johnny Gargano tonight. Zero crowd reaction for this guy, by the way. But another thing I want to point out is Dexter Loomis is with him. That seems like a bit of an odd pairing. Is he a love interest or something? Last time I watched the WWE, they just brought Loomis back and he was supposed to be a big deal. I guess that's not gone well then. Gargano hits him with a bunch of flying moves. Dominic turns it around through cheating. He lands the three amigos to booze. Gargano responds by suplexing him back into the corner. He almost wins with a spear through the ropes. Dirty Dom continues cheating and it almost costs him the match when the super kick connects. Later on, Dom tries the 619, which doesn't connect. Now Gargano lawn darts him into the corner. It's a nice move. Shades of when Kevin Nash did it to Rey Mysterio. Dominic front suplexes him away and then wins with a frog splash to the back. A really nice TV match. Dominic makes fun of Rey for rejecting the WrestleMania match request and calls him scared. But he says that he's now figured out a way to get the match with Rey at Mania. He will ask his mum. I do want to like this because Dominic Mysterio is an entertaining character. But come on, writing team, you've got to do better than that. You could pay the Hawk the half of the money the writing team get and I could do way better. Edge has his face in a dark room. He looks like a bit of a nutcase. He's going to have a Hell in a Cell match at Mania. It feels like he got his promo tips from the dead man for this one. Rhea Ripley slaunters out to the ring next. Ripley somehow has six different accents all at once. This is the sort of diversity that the Hawk loves in his wrestling. She also has a lisp, so that's bonus points. She threatens Charlotte Flair for Mania. These storylines are just incredible. Can you imagine how much work goes into pointing at the WrestleMania sign? No, come on, Hawk. You're slipping into negative territory again. She says at WrestleMania, she will become the biggest star in WWE history. I truly believe she will. Three identical twins interrupt her. I would call them the dollhouse, but I'm on the edge of my seat of excitement at these beautiful, strong women's athletes. A match is made official between Bailey and Ripley. Ripley does a dodge on the outside, which takes out the twins. Then she always wins with a big knee. Rhea has too much power for Bailey, so Bailey responds by cheating. Before the match really gets going, Becky Lynch, Trish Stratus, and Lita come out to ringside to even up the numbers. Bailey calls her move the Bailey to Belly, which is solid commentary in the Hawks' opinion. Rhea connects with double boots to the face, but her submission fails. All the other women fight on the outside. Ripley wins with a powerbomb. You'd think it'd be a big deal that Lita and Trish Stratus are here, but they're barely shown. Exactly the way it should be, because these guys are no longer the stars and Rhea Ripley is. This girl was great. Comedy in the back with a chiseled man and a broader man. These guys are comedy genius. I still don't know what they said. Ricochet and Braun Strowman don't get an entrance. Chad Gable has a match with Ricochet. This match is basically two guys trading incredible moves and pinfalls for five minutes. It's really good until Otis is taken away by a lady in army camo. He's thrown off his stride and Ricochet wins with a shooting star. It's time now for Bianca Belair to team up of Oscar to take on Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. I just love how it's so many matches with not much of a story. It means nothing can possibly distract from the in-ring action. Oscar looks a bit like Sue Young on crack. That's what the Hawk thinks anyway. Belair and Oscar, who are partners who don't get on. Piper Niven, the former TNA reject, is rapid as she moves around the ring. It's really impressive seeing someone move this fast. Despite that, Belair almost beats with a crossbody. The partners who don't get on still win when Belair beats Piper Niven with a face buster. If that was Piper Niven's roster debut, it was simply a work of art. Round of applause. Really good seeing her. Thanks for coming. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Her charging around the ring. <sighs> I'm trying to be positive. Come on. It was embarrassing. It didn't look good. I'm sure this girl is a great wrestler, but this was not a good showcase for her. Oscar kills Belair to end that segment. Roman Reigns to end the show. He's facing Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania. I'm certainly pumped for that match. What a card WWE are treating us to. Reigns has Paul Heyman and Solo don't look at his ass Sokoa as backup. Cody Rhodes interrupts almost straight away. Man, this guy's awesome. Look how his fans are singing his song. Can you imagine being at WrestleMania seeing Cody Rhodes live? The Hawks hoping I can make it to the next Mania. Cody wants to know why Raymond doesn't like him. The answer is that Raymond doesn't like professional wrestlers. He only likes real fighters. Wow, and then it gets borderline shoot. Raymond accuses Cody of bailing on the WWE because he didn't like being Stardust. But then Raymond goes one step further and says Cody started his own promotion, but he couldn't even get over there. I can't believe they're even acknowledging AEW. This is bizarro land. Things have really changed in the WWE. They must feel threatened. 
I can see why people would compare this to the Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars because both companies seem to be acknowledging each other on a weekly basis. Cody says that everything Roman said was true. He says by starting his own company, he's enabled the world to be a better place for wrestlers. Cody doesn't want to be called a wrestler though, and he doesn't want anyone talking about his dad Dusty either. Cody says at Mania he's going to remind Roman what it's like to lose, and also that Usos are going to leave him. He also says Sokoa isn't ready, and he'll leave him too. He will be a chief without a tribe. Roman looks very sad. Roman and Heyman leave, but Sokoa doesn't. Cody tells him again he knew he wasn't ready. He blocks his move. Roman stops a curb before anything else can happen. The show goes off the air with chants of, you're not ready. Wow, I love that ending to Raw. Raw's just improved so much. I love how they don't interrupt the matches with filler storyline stuff. The women, ugh, no comment. It was just a bad match, wasn't it? It was essentially a full show of wrestling minus the last 10 minutes, which was a great Cody Rhodes promo. WrestleMania is shaping up to be an exciting card. Let the Hawk know what you would give that Raw episode out of 10. I truly love to hear all the squad's opinions. I personally think it was a 7.5 out of 10, maybe an 8. Okay, let's see what we've got next. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Dude, have you ever seen Marky D123? The Hawk. Never heard of him. Terrible YouTube channel, dude. No? Nope. Got it. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You talking about The Hawk? Yeah, The Hawk. I'm gonna make you do the J-O-B! I'm talking about The Hawk, man. But it's a terrible channel, man. Huh? Terrible, terrible. Uh, you want some too? No, no, no. Better like and subscribe. Marky D, one, two, three. I'll smack you one. Oh, yeah. Promoters. Book Slice Boogie. Or else you can shove it. You heard Boogie Woogie. Subscribe to The Hawk now. Next up is the TNA show. Now, The Hawk really hated this show but maybe over time they've learned to grow. And I'm coming into this with a new positive mindset. If you want to watch TNA, just buy a membership on their YouTube channel. I honestly cannot recommend the Impact Plus app anymore. Too many advertisements and you can watch their pay-per-views for free on YouTube anyway. The show starts with a fight in a graveyard between PTO and Eddie Slapner Edwards. Yes, I'm still calling him that for consistency, but I'm hoping the Hawk can enjoy him more now. But first, PTO is screaming on a cliff for Eddie. Don't you just love how he's always the main character on the TNA show? We kick things off with Speedball Mike Bailey. He looks like the Karate Kid. He teams up with the Squid Jonathan Gresham. I know I hated on Gresham a lot before, but new day, new mentality. Gresham could be a star for any company he wrestles for. They face Crazy Steve and Black Tarus, Decay. Decay look weird without Rosemary. Gresham looks like Bobby Lashley as he continues to overpower Crazy Steve until Decay cheat and they double team the Squid. Steve does a Russian leg sweep into a Taurus diving drop kick to the nutsack. Gresham eventually lands his own drop kick and tags Bailey. He hits a bunch of karate kid kicks into a shooting star. He tries another kick which Steve catches and bites his bare feet. Taurus hits him with a nice bat breaker. Then he hits a Samoan drop. The new and improved Hawk is totally okay with that. I'm accepting of anyone doing it, even if you're not Samoan or fat. And to be honest, I can't tell if Taurus is skinny or fat. Taurus is an absolute menace, but Gresham eventually takes him out with a moonsault and Bailey hits a wacky diving knee move. Taurus kicks out at one. Gresham smacks him in the back of the head with Crazy Steve having to make the save on the pin. Bailey hits Taurus with a spinning knee in the corner followed by a middle rope wacky knee dive. Incredible ring work. These guys are really talented. It's a shame Taurus had to take the loss. I like him. Bailey and the squid shake hands because impact is ROH. Perk Alexander cuts a promo about how great Kazarian and Rich Swan are. They threaten the Bullet Club. Steve Macklin walks up and calls them all geeks. Giselle Shaw and her two friends are really great. Giselle doesn't like Mickey James, and I don't either if she ain't down with the Shaw. Johnny Swinger and some other guy march up with socks in their knickers. This kind of toilet humour is not acceptable in 2023. Giselle says, who the hell are you? I'd like to know who the hell he was too. Swinger says Adrian Street and Bruno San Martino. He threatens one of the crew and says, make sure you tuck your chin on my finish. I guess it's a Scott Hall special. Steve Macklin is here now looking pissed off as usual. He faces Heath. This guy's been incredible since leaving the WWE. Just look at all his achievements. Heath has become a household name. Unfortunately for him, this match is mostly Macklin beating the Hawk out of him. Heath, to his credit, manages to kick out of the Batbreaker. Heath retaliates with the cab driver slam, but he can't finish the match with it. Now you might be shocked, but Heath does not win this match. He loses to the double arm DDT. Steve Macklin's good, but does he need a gimmick? Let the Hawk know. 
Three unique ladies make fun of witches. No idea what they said. They keep talking about magic or something. PCO is walking in Las Vegas looking for slap nuts. The camera stays on the Las Vegas sign for an uncomfortable amount of time, but that's okay. Some viewers might be a bit slow. Mike Bailey and the Squid want to have a match at the next pay-per-view. Good for them. Swinger and that other guy are here now to face Jay Vidal. He makes the girls yell. This is two colourful characters right here. It's just a run-of-the-mill comedy match. Whether it's funny or not, you decide. Swinger's friend is banished, and so are the other people. Diana Praza attacks Shaw while she tries to leave. Love me some Diana. Security take her away, unfortunately. That's the most we see of her on this show. Jay Vidal wins. Even the new and improved Hawk can't recommend this one. Pre-tape promo. Former redneck comedy character Cody Dina is running a creepy cult with Connor the Rat. Sammy Callahan wants to join the group. Not sure why he'd want to. He's not even bold like the others are. I wish more wrestlers could be bold. PCO is yelling at the Impact Wrestling sign. Wow, squids, witches, cults, Frankensteins, monsters. There's a lot of colourful characters on this show. Tommy Dreamer meets with Mickey James. No idea what happens. Royden Grace walks up and threatens Mickey. What do you guys think of Jordan Grace's new look? I miss Vic Mama Pump personally, but let the hawk know. Eddie Slapnuts Edwards is in the ring now. He looks like one of the stoner friends. He says he's ended PCO. Then some dramatic music plays and it's PCO. But a car hits him. It was slap nuts, and he did it for The Rock. I guess it was a video package, but it was just such a jarring cut I didn't notice. Then there's lightning and thunder back in the arena. And wow, I'm just not sure what to make of this. It's very early 90s gimmick. Kenny King jumps PCO with a shovel. PCO won't stay down though, and he takes out King. They stop PCO by sandwiching him with the steps into the ring post. He just won't die though. The double teaming continues. Slapnuts does his finisher into a chair against PCO's head. They also smack him with a stick. A pretty unusual story here, but at least it's something different. Santino meets with Fandango backstage. These two guys are pretty new in TNA and Santino is a management figure. Joe Hendry's also here. He's really great. Santino asks the other two to be a team for some reason. Unfortunately, this team have nothing in common. Taylor Wilde is now a witch. <laughs> for some reason. And she has a witch friend called Killian King. They are the Coven. More like the Shoven. They face Rosemary and Tyre Valkyrie. Lots of people with issues on this show tonight. How did Taylor become a witch anyway? It's the opposite to her old character. These two teams are feuding because the Death Dolls don't like witches. This match is for the Knockouts Tag Titles. Taylor does do a cool leg choke across the ropes. The commentary team actually acknowledged that Taylor was the original Knockouts champion. Nice to see them put some TNA history in there for once. The Blue Thunder Bomb can't end it for Ty Valkyrie. Killian King beats Valkyrie with a pump handle suplex. Now bear in mind what happened in this match and how it ended. It's going to be extremely important for the end of the video. The Witches are the new tag team champions. I'd like to recommend this match, but I can't. At least Killian King looks like a witch, so it makes sense. TNA moves on to talk about New Japan for 5 minutes. This is so great, I love hearing about new wrestlers I've never heard of. Feed your mind. The main event is Perk Alexander teaming with Kazarian, who's unfortunately lost all his charm since the Christopher Daniels days. They also team with Rich Swan. It's a good time for me to mention now that Josh Alexander has had to relinquish his belt because he's got an injury. So his title reign is over, his record breaking title reign. Best wishes for your recovery Josh Alexander. The opponents are the Bullet Club, Chris Bay, Ace Austin and Kenta. The old Hawk would have hated this match, but not the new one. Really fast paced start to this one. The Bullet Club seems to be losing until Ace Austin hits a springboard drop kick. People in the crowd are very excited to see Kenta. They're saying his name frantically. Alexander stops him with a Green Bay plunge. We cut to an advert break and when we come back the Bullet Club are kicking Rich Swan all over the ring. They do a leg sweep, Russian leg sweep followed by more attacks. Kazarian gets the tag and hits some familiar offense. Man, this is great. He double DDTs the Bullet Club. Perk Alexander is in. He hits a beautiful swinging backbreaker. Rich Swan connects with a 450, but Ace Austin makes the save. Alexander takes Kenta out on the ring apron, and now there's a bunch of dives. Kaz catches Chris Bay's dive with a cutter. What a move. Back in the ring at 9. Everyone hits big moves. Again, Alexander takes out Kenta. Josh pauses though because he sees the miserable looking Macklin on the ramp. He pays for his ADHD. The Bullet Club beats Swan with the art of finesse into the fold. A good match which finally showed a chink of weakness in the armour of Perk Alexander. 
Although, with hindsight, it doesn't really matter. That's the show. Unfortunately, the most interesting part was Eddie Slapner Edwards fighting Frankenstein. It's okay for wrestling, but the lack of budget can be a turnoff. I genuinely do think TNA is trying. They're at least trying to be different in their own wacky way. It's a 5 out of 10. Okay, next up, the Hawks' favourite wrestling show, MLW. If you want to watch MLW, just head over to their YouTube page. They upload full shows there. The show starts in extremely bizarre fashion. Enzo Amore, real one, is in a wheelchair and has hijacked the show. Not sure how when he's in a wheelchair. It's a strange and coherent rant about the man he's feuding with, Marte Warner. He was run over. Lots of people did it for The Rock tonight. Best line he said was, any man can piss on the floor, but it takes a great man to crap on the ceiling. Monte Warner makes his way out, and the real one screams he's going to call the cops. Before that can go anywhere, there's a strange cut to a man saying, people know his name. No, they don't actually. This is another broad man called Ricky Shane Page. He'll fight Warner in a weapons match. A more on commentary is funny. What's your name? Joe? Okay, Joe Schmo. Warner is known for hardcore, but misses his elbow drops. Warner starts doing Dusty Rhodes elbows. As we come back from adverts, there are so many weapons in the ring. Warner stacks some boards in the corner, but first it's a net breaker across a chair. Warner quickly follows it for spear into the boards. Ricky Shane responds with a big throw through the other board. Chairs are set up now and Warner suplexes him through the stack. Shockingly, that isn't the free. They trade punches for a bit now into a lariat from Monty. Just another two. Some weirdos in mass are at ringside. They set up a table. Warner proceeds to hit a DDT off the apron through the table. Man, these two guys want to kill each other for seemingly no reason. Enzo gets out of his wheelchair and smacks Warner with his crutch. Ricky does a dodgy looking choke slam into a kick for the free. Crazy match. Oh no, it's Tyre Valkyrie again. They're making puking noises at some poor girl. I barely even noticed that John Morrison was there. Taya will give her a woman's title shot at some point. MLW manager Cesar Duran is here introducing a wrestler called Lair Strella, apparently Japanese, but his name doesn't sound it. He will challenge for the middleweight title, which belongs to Lince Dorada. We come back from an advert break, with the first thing we see being a prolonged handstand into a head scissors. Man, how many hours did these guys train to pull that one off? Lair Strella hits a big dive out the ring and comes back to the ring of a springboard. Dorado does a nice reversal in the corner into a German suplex. He keeps going with arm drags and head scissors. Now a handspring into a cutter. Dorado really impresses me here. He dives the head scissors onto Estrella on the apron. Then there's a double down as both guys seemingly get the idea and collide in the ring. It doesn't look great. Back up, Dorado hits a turtle wolf followed by two middle rope moonsaults. The third is blocked. Estrella responds with a baseball slide German suplex. He comes back into the ring with a drop kick and then a reverse spike Rana. How the hell does Dorado kick out? He must be the strongest luchador of all time. They fight on the top where Dorado snaps off a super hurricanrana. Caesar Duran breaks up the pin. Yay, it's Microman, everyone's favourite wrestler. He takes out a masked henchman. The match continues with Dorado hitting a powerbomb. The shooting star connects and Dorado wins it. Really fun match, loved it, especially Microman. Now a contract signing for the world title. The challenger is Jacob Fatu. The crowd go bananas. Hammerstone is the champion. This is the biggest match they could do, and this will be the second time of it happening. And they both just signed the contract. I guess the smack talking comes after. It's really poorly mic'd. Hammerstone says he doesn't care who Fatu's family are, and they immediately come to blows. I feel like they could and should have gone further with this. Samoan family members are shown in the audience. Now a match for the tag titles. The challengers are the Samoan SWAT team. I didn't even realise Juicy Finua was Samoan. They are jumped straight away by the champions Calvin Tankman and EJ and Duca. There are some big dudes on this roster. Another big man they could re-sign is Slice Boogie or Smack Them One. Anyway, this tag match seems to be pretty much a hardcore one. Tankman and Juicy Finua sit down and punch each other. Nothing to do with cardio, it just looked cool. EJ and Duca hits a somersault. Lance doesn't want to be outdone and hits his own tope out the ring. A table is in the ring now. EJ hits a spine buster on Lance through the table, somehow just the two. It turns out that Juicy Fenner is a Tongan, but he was trained by Samoans. Makes sense. Juicy bulldozes everyone. He looks for a double Samoan drop, but he's not strong enough. Instead, he hits a double crossbody. Juicy starts stripping. This guy is so intimidating. He somehow hits a big dive out of the ring. Lance follows it with a top rope splash on the judge, but just the two. 
Juicy tries his own top rope dive, but he's too slow and he's thrown. Man, EJ and Duker is massive. The champions connect with a double team, but it's just a two. EJ tries to cheat with Powder, which Lance super kicks away. Juicy does a Samoan drop, quickly followed by Lance's diving splash. It's over. The Samoan swap team have won the belts. Jacob Fatu, other relatives, and strangely, Sabu celebrate in the ring. What a feel-good moment that is. Man, the Hawk loved this show. It's so much fun and variety in such a short space of time. For someone like me who struggles to concentrate, it's perfect. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. It would be a 10, but my usual complaint stands. Your show is a bit too short, and I'm not sure they can maintain this momentum over the course of two hours. Now that being said, we've got one show left to watch, and I'm really excited for this one. It's time for AEW Dynamite. AEW will start with the world champion MJF. To those who don't watch AEW, but just follow the internet news, this man seems to be the face of the company nowadays. He's just so recognisable. MJF has ladies walk him to the ring. Then he locks beaks with one. It's great to see them making an effort to make him look like a star. It seems he's here to hold some sort of celebration. The fans chant for him, and he's supposed to be a heel. He shuts them down by saying that Shawn Michaels is better than Bret Hart. He keeps talking about he's Jewish. So it's a Jewish gimmick. It's not a gimmick, actually. He's hyping a match that's happening with Brian Danielson. It seems he's throwing a rebar mitzvah. This is one of the most bizarre things I've seen on a wrestling show. Jungle Boy, who is a wrestler, interrupts the celebrations. Then there's another interruption with Sammy Kavara. It must be cold in the building as he has a winter coat on. Now Darby Allen has something to say. MJF is livid about all these interruptions. They all want a title match. Jungle Boy's reason for asking for a shot is that MJF has been handed lots of opportunities, loads of TV time. Jungle Boy wants to change his own place in the company by taking the belt. MJF says that they're all jobbers and that's why they don't get TV time. Lots of insider terms are used here by Sammy Kavara. He says he was supposed to be a job guy and a bumper for Jericho. Darby Allen seems to be getting the most crowd noise. He cuts a promo about how he refuses to change, but that's why he loves AEW as they let him be him. Darby deserves to be champion because he actually cares about the company. MJF points out that he doesn't need a legend behind him backing him to get himself over like the other guys. MJF says he keeps this company in business. He refuses to give any of them a title shot. The eventual fight with MJF smashing into his cake. Pretty fun opening segment. Moxley, Wheeler and Claudio take on Adam Page, Stu Grayson and Evil Uno. The entrances go on forever, I'm not sure why, nothing's happening. They just stood around for five minutes. What were the Blackpool Club waiting for? William Regal to return? It's Eva Luno getting isolated straight away. Claudio slams him from the top. Wheeler looks like the weak link of this Blackpool Club. And that's proved right when Uno bat body drops him. Stu Grayson gets the tag and has a really impressive run of moves. It's just a lot of fun to watch him. Claudio turns it around with cheating and sends him from the ring. The Blackpool crew spike pile driver him on the outside. He must be dead. But man, this Stu Grayson is incredible. How does he kick out? He's back suplexed and put in a Texas cloverleaf. He makes the ropes though. Man, what a fighter. Stu Grayson must be the strongest man on the roster. Now it's a single leg Boston Crab. This guy just won't quit. Now it's another pile driver from Moxley. Still Grayson kicks out. This is amazing. Stuart Grayson leaves everyone in amazement. He finally tags Adam Page. Scott Hall special from Adam Page. Yuta is powerbombed and Evil Uno hits the Swanton Bomb. Oh no. Dude, I was watching the AEW wrestling show the other day, man. And this dude, Evil Uno, he stole my Swanton Bomb finishing maneuver, man. But it didn't finish. Man, I'm going back to Carolina. And I'm going to tell my stoner friend Shannon all about you, evil Uno man. There's bodies flying everywhere. Moxley and Paige come face to face. These two are rivals. Unfortunately, the ref is distracted and Wheeler Yuta takes out Paige with ring bell. The Grayson once again leaves the Hawk in amazement. Uno and Grayson should have it won, but they don't. Now a big double team, but the pin is broken up. The crowd chant, this is awesome. Unfortunately, the numbers edge catches up to our heroes and Grayson is killed and then beaten by submission. The club are bad winners and dicks, so they continue the attack. Excellent opener and Grayson looked like a star. A man called Juice Robinson laughs about beating up Ricky Starks. No idea what he said, but he has a cracking set of teeth on him. Taz is resembling a spud more and more as the days go by. 
Now it's a title match. Jade Cargill, the champion, versus Nicole Matthews, who's apparently an independent wrestling star. I haven't got to see much of Cargill in this series, but she has an incredible look to her. Jade floors her opponent with a pump kick, quickly followed by a finisher. It goes about 10 seconds. A shame, I wanted to see more from her. Cargill acts like she's going to beat up the interviewer. Oh no, not again. Tyre Valkyrie is here for the third time at this point. Even this new positive hawk struggling to remain excited for seeing her a third time. More like a third time. Do you find Tyre Valkyrie good or interesting? Let the hawk know. Tyre kills Jay Cargill's friend. I think they have the same finisher. Hopefully that's the last time I see her tonight. So think about what we saw tonight. Over on the TNA show, Tyre was beaten by some nobody. But in AEW, she's apparently a top contender. I just don't think that's helping. No more negativity, I don't need it. A depressed looking Ricky Starks whispers a promo. He says the Bullet Club hasn't been relevant for years. Well, he's got that right. A segment called QTV now. They make fun of Wardlow's downfall. Someone broke into his car, but at least they didn't run him over. They make fun of Wardlow's haircut. Ruthless aggression and Spike TV champion. The segment ends when I was starting to enjoy it. Wait, that music. Oh no. A wild slap nuts of this. Now I said no negativity, but the Hawk would not do the J.O.B. to slap nuts. I am trying to evolve as a person, but I'm regressing. This slap nut is everywhere in my life. He ruined my life. My mental health. I just want to move on from TNA and enjoy a new show. But Jeff's Slapnut Jarrett is here. I can't escape him. This stupid Memphis mid-carder curly-haired custard looking idiot is all over the place. It's a title match too against Orange Cassidy and Jeff's strutting all over the ring. He's having a good old time at the Hawks expense. Jarrett does the pockets thing. If Jarrett wins, we riot. Crowd brawling because it wouldn't be a Jarrett match without crowd brawling. I wonder which special move he's going to be beating Orange Cassidy with. Man, so many Jarrett signs in this crowd, but the best one is missing. Sanjay Dutt is also here. He's Slapnut's friend. Also some giant dude. Jarrett puts on the sharpshooter because we're in Canada. That doesn't work and Cassidy reverses the move. Still waiting on one of the four moves of Dune. Well, the ref keeps getting distracted but not bumped. Jarrett now gets the figure four on. Cassidy fights out of it. <laughs> then... Then there is a ref bump. The guitar is in the ring, but a woman referee rushes out. Somehow, she is strong enough to pull the guitar away from Jeff Jarrett. I'm sorry, I'm not buying that. The ref sends the Jarrett crew to the back. Cassidy hits a DDT and kips up. Come on, Orange, don't lose to this slap nut. I beg you. The ref is distracted again. Jay Lethal rolls into the ring and smacks Cassidy out. Oh, thank God Cassidy kicked out of that one. Cassidy reverses the stroke. And there's the orange punch. That's the three. Wow, how did Slapnuts lose? He held all the cards. Brilliant match and it's always great to see Jarrett lose. The Hawk keeps his sanity. Music video for the Acclaim now. Can't hate on these guys. The best wrestlers all have additional talents in the Hawk's opinion. Some emo chicks are here now. These girls are so powerful and inspiring. Ruby Riot is here to tell a story. She says the grass was greener in AEW until a couple of bitches arrived and pissed everywhere. Including her hair by the looks of it. One of them calls the crowd neckbeard sticky twats. <laughs> more of this girl, please. Other girls have heard enough and there's a big fight. More and more girls run out, which makes the outcasts dump in their thongs and leave. Two guys cut a promo with really poor mic quality. I'm sorry, the Hawk could barely hear them. The main event is a three-team trios title match. The House of Black, the Champions versus Omega and the Young Bucks versus the Jericho Appreciation Society. The crowd are excited for Jericho and Omega because they're from just down the road. Brody King is a scary looking dude. Jericho's in his hometown here. Jericho and Omega both look like Randy the Ram. The House of Black choose to isolate Jericho. He fights back by rolling back the ears of a nice backbreaker. It's a nice flurry from Nick Jackson now, but he's caught and thrown into the House of Black's big knee. Omega has a run now with some suplexes and dives. This guy's so smooth, the Hawk's really coming round to him. Jericho and Omega have another face-off. It doesn't last long and the match breaks down. Y2J manages the walls to a massive ovation, but the Bucks break it up. This match is chaos. You don't want to miss this one. They must be teasing another match between Jericho and Kenny. They should do it in this arena here. They're loved. Omega takes Jericho out of a huge dive. That triggers everyone else to dive. Jericho and Omega work together to suplex Brody King from the top. 
the code breaker on Omega just gets a two. Matt Jackson hits four Northern Light suplexes without release. So cool, not seen that one before. The finishers are really flying like the Hawk now. Brody King hits some splat attacks and the match turns. Jericho is in a three on one situation. It's great booking in his hometown. You want to see the hometown hero overcome the odds. Unfortunately, he's killed, but Omega saves the pin. Jericho takes out Brody King with a bat, but he kicks out of the pin. He's sent away and the House of Black win with the Dante's Inferno. Jack Swagger is here, dressed like a goofball. I forgot this guy even existed. The show goes off the air with the Blackpool guys being dicks again, but they are scared of the elite. What a match. The only negative I have is I wish the House of Black could dominate and power their opponents more. They had a strength advantage, but they didn't use it until the end. Still, great show, better than Raw. I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10. And Slapnuts lost, thank God, so I could enjoy that match. I almost lost my composure and devolved back into the old Hawk. And I think if Slapnuts ever wins a belt in AEW, it'll be game over for the new Hawk. Great wrestling this week. MLW and AEW are my favourites. I feel refreshed and full of positive energy to keep bringing the content. Let the Hawk know who put on the best show this week. I truly appreciate all of you watching and your opinions matter. And if you don't agree with that, I'll get mad like the Hatter. Oh, he's the shove it. Man.